I'm June Gruber, an Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Colorado Boulder. We're here today with Dr. Jim Cohn, a Professor of Psychology at the University of Virginia, who's here to speak with us about his experience with science communication and outreach. This is part of a four-part interview series on communicating psychological science with the public, sponsored by the Association for Psychological Science. Thanks for joining us today, Jim. Thank you for having me on this great, you know, interview set. Awesome. So I just wanted to start today by asking you if you could tell us a little bit about the kind of public outreach work you do. I do. I'd say in terms of public outreach, what I mainly have done, probably the, the, the most prominent thing I've done is uh, my podcast, which is called Circle of Willis, which is a little bit obscure, but I thought it was funny because it's uh, the, the name of a, a, a blood distribution system in the center of your brain uh, that also happens to look like a little man or a little woman. I mean, it depends. But uh, um, uh, so that was funny. It was also um, my aspiration early in my life for that to be the name of my rock band. That mm -hmm. didn't work out. So I went with the podcast instead. So there's Circle of Willis. Um, I'm pretty active on things like Twitter and other social media, and I've, I've even done some op-ed writing uh, in, in a few places here and there um, as part of a, a kind of activism that I've been uh, trying to uh, uh, enact, you might say. So what got you into doing this? What made you want to do a podcast, Circle of Willis? Well, it's funny because the, one of the funny things about it is that when I was young, when I was a teenager, I used to record me and my friends all the time. And I used to record us uh, doing all kinds of crazy things. And it, and it, and it extended to the period of time even that I, I lived in Taiwan and had crazy experiences. I put some of them, uh, some clips of that in the first episode of my podcast just to prove it. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> But then, but then um, start, starting really in the 90s, when I was working with Beth Loftus and John Gottman, I, I wound up sort of engaged with media a fair amount of the time and sort of got exposure to it, got a little bit comfortable with it, I guess, in a way. And um, fast forward many years later, I, I, I've got um, a reporter from NPR News named Barbara Bradley Haggerty. And she was visiting my lab here at Virginia. And we did our story, you know, I put her in the scanner and shocked her while her friend held, held her hand. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we, were, we were talking afterwards about, um, you, you know, how much she wished she could put more of what we had discussed into the news spot. She was gonna have to cut it down to 30 seconds or, you know, or two minutes or whatever it was. And there was so much more interesting. And, 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 I was, and I told her, you know, I'm really frustrated with my inability uh, to get what I know out to more people in an accessible form. And she said, have you tried podcasting? And I said, nope. And I kind of knew what podcasting was, but I didn't really know what podcasting was. You know, it wasn't really, it wasn't, it wasn't on my radar in any significant way. I thought it was kind of a niche. It is a niche uh, kind of hobby for a lot of people but she said no you gotta do a, a podcast and i said well i don't i can't <laughs> i don't know how i'm not an npr reporter and she she said well i'll help you and she did she she uh helped me sort of with a lot of advice a lot of really really concrete advice i got uh, help from other people i have some notes here I got um, help from uh, Lulu Miller, who was one of the um, uh, uh, creators of the, the podcast Invisibilia. And she helped me also in a bunch of practical ways, but also with um, sort of uh, guidance for how to structure episodes and things like that. I, I sometimes followed her advice. <laughs> and it turns out the times that I really did, uh, those were the episodes that were far and away the most popular. But then um, it just happened that at the time, the Center for Media and Citizenship here at UVA, which is uh, led by Siva Vijanathan, who's um, 
who's a, a rising star among the sort of uh, public intellectuals of the country, um, was looking to uh, invest in podcasts that uh, might have something to do with you know social engagement, democracy, citizenship. Um, and we got talking, I can't remember how, but I didn't think that mine would qualify, but he did. So he, and he sort of ensured that it would by becoming the executive producer. <laughs> so he did that. I got a lot of, a lot of uh, recording nuts and bolts helps from a local radio station, um, WV, uh, uh, TJU, uh, a guy named Nathan Moore. And then, you know, I reached out to um, a friend of mine, uh, an old friend of mine who was part of a really popular band in Tucson when I was a graduate student there. His name is Tom Stoffer. And I said, hey, can I use your music for my podcast? He's like, yeah, just use it. And he made more. And now I have, so I have this incredible original music that nobody else has. It's just, what? And then, of course, Paul Reyes uh, at uh, Virginia Quarterly Review has uh, also given me some resources. So, you know, once it started, it, it just sort of took off on its own. And, you know, part of the reason that I wanted to do it is because, you know, thinking about, I'm, I, you know, I'm a first gen college student. And um, it has long been difficult for me to find ways to bridge my my culture of origin which is very working class um almost nobody i mean I, college is like you know a faraway city that you hear about on the news and the 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 culture i inhabit now it's really hard to sort of bridge that and i've al i've always been passionate about trying to do so because i know from first hand experience how bright all of my non college educated family and friends are um, and how interested in this stuff. And so uh, trying to somehow make it accessible uh, has been a, a major goal. But, you know, I, I also, I'm not a, I, I clearly, if you've listened to the podcast, I'm not a perfectionist. You know, I need to, I'm trying, I'm working this out as I go. That's great. I mean, and I like that you mentioned, you know, that when you got started, you didn't know what to do because I think a lot of people out there are wondering, like, how could I get started even doing this? You know, I've heard of podcasts, but never could imagine doing one myself. So hearing the details of your journey is really, just really amazing and inspiring too, how you brought people in with you and, and people from your own history and youth that kind of came in to contribute pieces too along the way. Yeah, it's been, um, it's been a process of sort of skiing downhill, absent one ski and just doing your best. Um, you know, the, 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 the object is to get to the bottom of the hill, <laughs> not to do so gracefully. Um, and, uh, and that's the way I've tried to approach it. I mean, so in keeping it real and, you know, just doing your best, how have you gone about over time since you started the podcast and now, you know, managing your time with respect to, you know, doing science, running a lab, having a family um, and, and fitting public outreach and all of that? Yeah, uh, I guess the short answer is not well. Uh, I haven't been managing it well, and this is one of the the lessons. I mean, this is this is uh, it's a big investment. It can be a big investment in time. I said I'm not a perfectionist, but I'm I'm, an, I'm enough of a uh, perfectionist, I guess, that I want to have like a clean episode. I want to work with Tom Stoffer to, um, you know, get the music right. And, you know, and at times I wanted to tackle some pretty tough issues. Um, and uh, those episodes, um, you know, I have, like you say, I have a lab, I have a funded lab with students and undergrads and, and um, projects and papers and, you know, all of that stuff takes time as you well know and others watching will know and i've got a family i've got two small kids <laughs> and um that's its whole that's a whole other adventure and um and so i wound up doing a lot of the podcast work sort of in the nooks and crannies of my life um in the middle of the night in the early morning 
you know, when I was out uh, uh, at conferences, you know, a lot of that stuff has, has gone up in smoke. And um, I, yeah, I would say also that one of the things that happened initially with the podcast, it was just my hobby. You know, it was just a thing that I did. I thought it was kind of fun. But um, people, it, ga it gained more listeners than I thought it was going. To. I mean, I didn't know. I don't know what's supposed to happen, right? I don't know how this is supposed to work. So I did an episode about uh, children at the border um, because I was like everyone uh, who's a thinking and compassionate person. I was incensed at what was going on and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I did an episode there and that episode um, darn near killed me for real. Um, uh, um, because it was just, it was a lot of work. I interviewed, uh, you know, five different, uh, world famous, uh, scientists who could comment on it and, um, worked pr more, more closely with Lulu Miller, uh, to make a, a slightly more Invisibilia like episode than I was used to, but I did all of the editing and things myself. And it was an enormous effort. Um, but then that went, I would say, mildly, with an emphasis on mildly viral. From viral for me. I mean, not not millions of people, but it went to Congress people. It went out to people at the UN. And so I wound up uh, writing an op-ed for the Washington Post about it. Anyway, all of this stuff um, just just ate me alive in terms of uh, the amount of time that it was taking while trying to run a lab and, and have a family. And uh, just before my, my massive heart attack, which I had, uh, that was largely stress related, um, uh, you know, I was talking with, with people about taking the podcast to a major outlet. Um, and I think that would have, something would have had to have changed. I would have had to change my world radically. And I'm just not ready to do that. So I wound up turning it down after, after almost dying. Not to be discouraging. You don't have to, you know, it, but the thing is, here's, here's the thing. These things are investments in time. And, you know, and I, and I want to be clear about that. And part of the reason that I want to be clear about that for any of uh, any people who might be watching this interview uh, is that I think there is a very important role for science outreach. And I don't think it is like falling off a log. It's real work. It's real work. And it's, I think, considered by a lot of the people uh, who, you know, evaluate us, our, you know, our peers, the, the sort of structures of professional uh, academic evaluation, they don't really know where to put that kind of work. It seems uh, alternately sort of frivolous and extracurricular curricular or something like that. But it's really, it's a real contribution and it is real work, and I and I and I guess my hope is that um, there, at the institutional level, there is increasingly some place for it. Right now at UVA, there really isn't. I mean, everybody loves it, right? But there's no, there's no way in which it gets um, included in part of the budget for your academic work, for example. So, I mean, you, you know, you talk about there's only, you know, 24 hours in a day, right, as a yeah. human being, and that, you know, this takes a significant chunk of time, and I appreciate you sharing kind of candidly the cost it can take to your own health, right, yeah. when we stretch ourselves if, thin, yeah. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's, <laughs> you're not going to have a heart attack if you start a podcast, come on, but, the, but, but um, you might actually just... Uh... <laughs> Um, but, but time management is, is, is really key. And this is one of the things that has been most difficult for that particular, uh, project. Yeah. Because one of the things that happens is when, if once you get started is people want more, right? They, they want more of it and that's very exciting. Um, and so you want to do more of it. 
and then they want more of it and then on and on and on you go. What kind of time investment? I mean, I know it's hard to count these things in terms of hours per week, but you know, in general, how much of your time on average do you spend doing this in a normal week, let's say? Well, I haven't been working on it since since the pandemic started, really. Uh, it was one of the things that I said, this is going to have to go on pause. I keep meaning to get back to it, but I'm also working on a book and I'm working on some other things. Um, I've continued to do also during the, um, the pandemic, a lot of news media, just talking to reporters and that is doing a sufficient amount of the outreach work that I want to do right now. But I have done a couple of interviews and wow, they really need to get out there. So, um, and I have, of course, a backlog of a bunch of them, a bunch of just tremendous interviews with amazing people. And each interview can take, I mean, if, if the interview is 45 minutes, it can easily take between five and 10 hours of editing if I want it to, you know, especially when you factor in putting together sort of the, the, the package, you know, with music and all of these kinds of things. And, and that stuff is not frivolous either, either. It's, it's important because it's part of what makes it enjoyable to listen to. It's part of the process of making it accessible. Accessibility isn't just about um, the words that you use when you're talking. It's also about how you invite people in emotionally, right? Um, and that's why we, that's why the, the experts and the professionals use music and uh, int introductory monologues and all of these things are for, uh, they're, they're ways to draw in an audience so that it's easier for them to consume what you want them to hear. And all of that stuff is really important and it takes time and it takes a team and getting help and getting advice and coordinating schedules and stuff, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. So, I mean, you've touched on this a bit, but kind of reflecting on your journey through, you know, public outreach and podcasting, is there something that stands out to you that you wish you knew at the time when you first started that you've learned now kind of through lived experience? Yeah. I mean, probably one of the things that, uh, I mean, I sort of have, have talked about that a little bit already. One of the things I really wish I'd known, I guess there's two things, how much time it really takes. Um, and how much other people like it is, is, I mean, people want to hear uh, their peers talk about their work in a way that's accessible, in a way that's, that's, that's approachable and relatable. Um, and the public wants to hear this stuff. You know, reporters want to hear it. Uh, Congress people I've even discovered uh, want, want to hear it. Um, administrators, uh, I got a lot of comments on my interview with Nalanjana Dasgupta and it's no surprise, it was tremendously, um, it was amazing. She's amazing. Um, and, uh, and, it was really fun doing a little bit to make sure that everybody else knew how amazing she was and what, and why we should be paying such attention to the work that she produces. Um, I wish I had thought more about money because um, I don't, I don't, I, I pay people a little bit when I get some, some funds here or there and I do get, some funds I get, I get um, underwritten, they say, uh, by uh, VQR, Virginia Quarterly Review, and uh, um, WTJU Radio, um, and the Center for Media and Citizenship, and all of that is great, but um, I really want to do more uh, to, you know, get a, a really good intern, for example, or, uh, you know, someone who can be a staff person, because then we could really do it, then we could really do it right. I mean, we, we do it, but it takes a long time. We could do it on, on more, of a, more of a schedule. By the way, I'm saying all of these things, oh, so much work and I almost died of a heart attack. Oh my God, this, why am I doing, why am I doing this? Because it's unbelievably fun. It's like, it's like the most fun thing I think I've maybe ever done in, in, uh, in academia. 
I mean, this I you know I tell my students well, before uh, podcasting, my favorite thing in the world was to go to um, to conferences and just run around hugging everybody. <laughs> I got I got to be careful. I'm gonna sound like Joe Biden in a second, but um, but I just have so many great friends. There's just so many great people. And it's always been something I've been super excited about to, to um, I always have great conversations with people all the time. And uh, it's been so exciting and fun to, to just record them. I mean, we, you know, initially, that's what Barbara Bradley Haggerty said. She said, just take the recorder and record them. And by the way, use this fancy equipment and make it sound good. And here's how you do it. Um, that's part of accessibility too. But uh, it is tremendous fun. It's so much fun. Oh my god! And I and when I think about the interviews I still haven't released that are that are you know what's what's sort of in the can, as they say, I like dropping podcast jargon. I feel <laughs> cool. But um, uh, there's just so much more. There's so much more. I mean, it sounds fun and just deeply meaningful in a way that. You don't often get a chance to do in our field, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So my last question for you is, you know, what advice would you have for psychological scientists, students, people in our field who want to get involved in public outreach? Yeah. Um, my first piece of advice is to uh, definitely lean toward what you know already. But I want to broaden what that means from uh, just beyond, um, you know, your specific research area, because the thing is, we're scholars, right? We're not just, I don't just study, you know, I mean, I, I, my empirical output is uh, these, you know, studies of uh, uh, social regulation of emotion, but, but gosh, I read so much more than that. You know, I teach a class called Why We Hold Hands for the new curriculum at, at UVA. And it's incredibly uh, fun and rich and it delves into the evolution and neuroscience of everything from touch to music to spirituality and our deep evolutionary origins. Uh, this is all stuff that's part of my domain of knowledge. But I also am a first gen college student. You know, I also, um, uh, have a bunch of other experiences. I've, I've, I've had experience with uh, memory research and uh, looking at the behavior of couples. I mean, there are, there, we know more than we think we know. And I think that one of the things that happens for a lot of reasons is that we are, uh, when, we th when we think about public outreach, the first thing that a scientist is trained to, to think is, oh my God, be circumspect. Do not, um, do not overstep your knowledge. That's good advice. That's not bad advice. But I, I want to push, push back a little bit and say, good God, you've, you've spent 20 years s studying more than the content of your published papers. You know things you know things and that's why you're in the position you're in and other people would like access to the things that you know now, how you do that is up to you there's blogging lots of people blog there's you know podcasting is a little bit more of an investment there's uh becoming involved in local politics um there's uh becoming involved in activism and uh um you know, local news. There, there's lots of things you can do with your school board, with your, you know, it, there's so many ways to, to sort of reach out to the public. Thank you so much, Jim, for speaking with us today as part of this, um, you know, four part interview series on communicating psychological science with the public. It was great talking to you. Thanks again. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah.